Hello, I'm Dr Gavin Speed. I'm an archaeologist with the University of Leicester Archaeological Services. And over the past 20 years, I've lived in Leicester, first studying as a student, then working as an archaeologist. During that time, I've had the pleasure to dig on many archaeological excavations, both in the UK and abroad. In 2017, I directed a large archaeological excavation within the city centre in Leicester. It was close to the High Cross shopping centre. The site was formerly a factory known as Stivi, and it revealed outstanding Roman remains, consisting of Roman houses, refined mosaics, Roman streets, and a Roman theatre. The history of my adopted hometown of Leicester continues to intrigue me. The historic city has hundreds of years of archaeological excavations and discoveries, but it's really only the, over the last 15 years that there's been a huge increase in urban redevelopment. And this has resulted in a vast amount of new archaeological work in the city. And so the result is, in the year 2020, we now have a wealth of new information on the people, places and their objects from Leicester's Roman, Saxon and medieval past. In this talk, I'll be giving an overview of the evolution of our understanding of the city's Roman past. I'll be looking at the key archaeological discoveries over time and we'll move through the four centuries of Roman rule from Leicester's Iron Age origins, its large Roman townhouses with their fine mosaics and its giant public buildings, all the way through to its economic collapse and decline in the early 5th century. I will utilise the latest discoveries and newest interpretations to reveal that the town was, like its modern counterpart, a truly multicultural urban environment. Firstly, where is Leicester within the Roman Empire? Well, looking at this map of the Roman Empire in the early 2nd century, it would seem that the town lies in a province very much on the edge of the empire. Zooming into Britannia, Leicester lies in the heart of the Midlands in England, and it's around 100 miles north of London, the capital of Britannia. The city was positioned at a crossing of the River Saw in a wide, flat floodplain. The Saw Valley is the dominant feature of Leicestershire, running across the county from south to north and throughout history and prehistory it has provided an important corridor for travel and communication and it divides the rich rolling farmland of East Leicestershire from the more rugged forested land of West Leicestershire. The town was well connected by Roman roads. The Foss Way passes through coming from Lincoln some 50 miles to the northeast and it heads southwest to the small town of High Cross and eventually far beyond um, to Exeter in the southwest. The major Roman routeways of Watling Street lay far to the south and Ermine Street to the northeast. But the importance of the town is indicated by various shortcuts along smaller routes to connect these major routeways. There are hardly any existing historic written records mentioning Roman Leicester, and this heightens the importance of archaeology. In the second century, Claudius Ptolemy, a second century mathematician, recorded areas of the Roman Empire, and he mentions the tribal area of the Coritani and Rate. So that's our earliest mention of Roman Leicester. In the late second or perhaps in the early third centuries, there is the document known as the Antonine Itineraries, and this is a list of stopping points on Roman roads. And again, Leicester is mentioned twice, Rattus, in Itineraries 6 and 8. And later on in the seventh century, in the Ravenna Cosmology, there's a list of Roman towns and road stations, and again, Leicester gets a mention. So apart from those historic records which mention the name, we also have this 
wonderful milestone found at Thermiston um, in 1771. And it records that the milestone is two miles from Ratis. So we have a name, but that's just about all the reckon, written records we have. So fortunately, archaeology can go a whole lot further to show us in much more detail how the people of Roman Leicester lived. So why Leicester? Well, the city is quite unusual compared to other Roman and other historic towns in Britain, in that it's one of the most excavated cities in Britain, probably second only to London. Because of this, it's given us a huge wealth of information. As you can see on this slide, we have a satellite image from Google Earth, and the yellow line shows the approximate position of where the Roman and medieval town defences stood. All the green blobs show some of the major excavations that have taken place in recent years, most of them being in the north and to the west parts of the city. The southeast area um, has seen some excavations, but these are very small scale. There are very few remains of Roman Leicester still visible above ground today, but clearly the most impressive remains are the Jewry Wall, part of the Roman public baths. This huge wall was possibly recorded in the 12th century. Geoffrey of Monmouth, who wrote the history of the kings of Britain and more famously known as popularising the King Arthur story, but he does mention Leicester. And perhaps in his description, he describes the underground vaults as being the semi-buried arches of the Jewry Wall. Much later, in 1622, the Leicestershire antiquarian William Burton made a uh, very significant archaeological discovery, and he describes in great depth some Roman remains. Now, almost certainly, this is a mosaic and hypercaust. Um, we don't know for certain exactly where it was, but he could again be describing part of the Jewry Wall Roman baths. A few decades later, one of the earliest recorded Roman mosaics in Britain in 1675 was found somewhere along High Cross Street. This is the only mosaic in Leicester and one of a handful in the Midlands that actually depicts figures, the others being all geometric patterns. And this octagonal panel would have formed part of a much larger floor of a Roman townhouse. Um, the dating is very uncertain based only on stylistic terms, so second or third century AD. Um, the image is a mythological one, likely to be that of Siparissus, showing a standing man with a stag and a winged cupid drawing his bow. Now, the precise location is uncertain, although a book from 1804 entitled A Walk Through Leicester, Being a Guide to Strangers, describes the mosaic as being in the cellar of Mr Worthington opposite the town prison. And we know that this is in the area of the Stibby excavations from 2017, where we discovered several large townhouses. So it's entirely possible that this mosaic belonged to one of those. By the 18th century, it's clear that the Jewry Wall was still very interesting to people. And William Stukeley came and recorded the wall in um, very good detail, as shown here. But the interpretation at the time was that this was a Roman temple or gateway dedicated to Janus. We now know it's part of the Roman baths. Um, interesting, really, looking at William Stukeley's map of Leicester here. So he includes modern Leicester, as it was in the 18th century, along with some more uh, ancient aspects. So he's drawn on the line of the Roman and medieval town defences, and he's also illustrated the Roman brick kilns found to the south. So this is our first map of Roman Leicester. So as we move into the 19th century throughout the Victorian period, um, it, it was a time when the town was seeing much urban growth, lots of new buildings, railways um, and other forms of development. So as such, there were lots of Roman discoveries during this time. 
um, and some of the big ones were the Roman mosaics and two most famous examples are shown here. So we have the Blackfriars pavement discovered in 1830 and then the Peacock pavement discovered in 1898 along with um, a few other Roman mosaics. Um, and I've also included this lovely lithograph by John Flower from 1826 as it shows really nicely the um, Roman ruins of the Jury Wall um, with current buildings built within it and around it. So towards the end of the 19th century a new map of Roman Leicester was produced by Fox shown here and again it doesn't really move on much further from the earlier map we saw from the previous slide. Again, we can see the line of the Roman and medieval town defences on the north, east and south side. There's a dashed line for the west line um, and then a few other fine spots are shown. So as we move into the 20th century, we move to the 1930s and this excavation at Drury Wall was the first archaeological excavation in Leicester. And it was led by a lady, Dame Kathleen Kenyon, um, a pioneering archaeologist and really um, very impressive to be led by a lady in the 1930s. Um, so the excavation itself came about because the old Victorian factories were demolished to make way for a new public swimming pools. And actually, they ended up finding the old Roman swimming pools, the Roman baths. So as such, the, um, the site was not built on and kept and preserved and is currently a museum undergoing renovation. So Drury Wall itself then is 23 metres long, 9 metres high and 2.5 metres thick. It's one of the largest pieces of Roman masonry still standing in Britain. Um, and as I said previously, um, from the medieval period onwards, the interpretation was that it was part of the Roman town gate or a temple and during Kathleen Kenyon's time her interpretation was that it was part of the forum and you can see from this plan here we've got an improved plan of Roman Leicester where street grids start to appear and the forum and basilica are shown but subsequent excavations have shown that it wasn't the forum this is the uh, Roman baths and the forum lay just adjacent in the next insula. So moving into the post-war later 20th century period, um, the first significant excavations were carried out by John Wacher in the late 1950s and he excavated a um, Roman townhouse and also the Roman Macellum at Blue Boar Lane, as you can see on this photo. Throughout the 1960s, 70s and 80s, the Leicestershire Archaeological Unit led by Jean Miller excavated many sites in Leicester, uh, most significantly located the Roman Forum, which is now underneath Jubilee Square. Um, there was, of course, the Shires Shopping Centre excavations in the 1980s. By 1995, um, the University of Leicester Archaeological Services was formed and they then undertook um, a few small excavations in the late 90s and this town plan here shows Roman Leicester as it was known around about the year 2000 ever so slightly afterwards and you can see lots of the excavations are plotted on we now have the street grid and insular numbers and um, the forum showing nicely along with some other buildings so really good development but um, all of this was about to change massively as we moved in to the 21st century. The 21st century has seen two major phases of urban redevelopment within Leicester. The first phase took place in the early 2000s and this was in, in advance of the new High Cross shopping centre. The second phase of urban redevelopment took place over the last five years, mainly in the western half of the city. And this has resulted in an explosion of archaeological excavations, mostly undertaken by ULAS. And this has allowed us to develop our understanding of Leicester's past. 
So let's now investigate in more detail to discover what we know about Roman Leicester in the year 2020. So let's now actually look at what we know about Roman Leicester and what we don't know. We do know that the town had Iron Age origins. It was a major Iron Age settlement and it may have looked something like this. Uh, most likely the capital of the Coriol Tavori, um, an Iron Age tribe um, in the East Midlands. Iron Age settlements of earlier date um, are known within the environs of Leicester. Ulas had done many excavations uncovering lots of Iron Age farmsteads and larger agglomerated settlements. But the earliest settlement we can find at Leicester dates to the late first century BC. We think this area would have covered about 10 hectares and most of it seems to be focused on the east bank of the River Saw. Um, most of the settlement evidence we have seems to be very close to the river, although some of the high cross excavations have since found early Iron Age evidence further east, and the Stibi excavations have subsequently found further curvilinear features and some Iron Age pottery, which suggests a more dispersed wider settlement. Um, and in common with most Iron Age settlements, we mainly find evidence of roundhouses, pits and ditches, um, and we've also found pottery, but unlike most other Iron Age settlements in Leicestershire, we've found lots of high quality imports from Gaul and Germany, um, and also lots of flan trays, which were used for making coins. And thanks to the work of Clay and Jean Miller, um, it's been suggested that this was a major center or oppidum of the people known to the Romans as the Coriotave. And these, this group of people were the most northerly to actually produce coins in the Iron Age. The Roman name for Leicester was Rate, which is the Celtic word meaning ramparts. So we could expect some pre-Roman earthworks associated with the town, although none have been found thus far. We move away from Leicester ever so briefly to mention this fantastic site at Hallerton, a small village in South East Leicestershire, discovered by um, local metal detectorists and then working in partnership with ULAS, where we excavated the site back in the early 2000s. And it's worth mentioning here because it shows an interesting connection from the Iron Age to the Roman period. The special site was a shrine and various special objects were deposited, including this Roman cavalry helmet, thought to be a diplomatic gift. Within the coins, there were 350 Roman examples and more than 5,000 Iron Age British examples. And some of the Roman coins were extremely old when they were buried, such as this silver denarius from the Roman Republic from around about 211 BC. These coins show that there was long distance trade and diplomacy between Leicestershire and Rome. So the Roman invasion began in AD 43, but we think it probably took them about five years before they got up to Leicester. The 14th Legion began to move uh, northwards through Cambridgeshire and then Northamptonshire and along the valley of the River Welland into Leicestershire. They would have passed Hallerton or very close to it and then on into Leicester. This route later became the Roman road known as the Via Divana. Um, and as they passed through Leicester, we believe a, a small fort was established and then the um, Army itself was established in Mansetter, which is just on the Leicestershire, Warwickshire border, where a fortress was established. It was excavations in the late 1960s and early 1970s near to the present West Bridge that uncovered very slight evidence um, for a 
large defensive ditch and timber buildings, which date to AD 43 to 69. So the interpretation is that this is a small fort established following the Roman invasion to control the point where the Fosway crossed the river Tor. There's also a couple of other finds and other hints of a military presence within the town as well. Later in the first century AD, the early Roman town expanded to the east, away from the river and the original late Iron Age settlement. Now the High Cross excavation has found hints of decorated wall plaster and opus signinum from these early buildings, but most of the buildings that are on a different alignment to the later street grid have been found in very poor condition, truncated or disturbed by later buildings. Our understanding of the first 50 years or so of the Roman town is quite poor. Um, a few buildings have been discovered that don't fit onto the later street alignment, notably along the Bath Lane area um, and also others further east. But the recent excavations at Stibby are probably the most extensive for the um, evidence of this early period. And you can see in this photograph here, archaeologists working on some of the earliest evidence we had cutting into the natural ground can see the beam slots and post holes being excavated and these are all very early Roman buildings. Together with the actual structural evidence we had lots of Roman pottery as well and once these are analysed hopefully we will get a better understanding of the nature of these buildings. So watch this space. As we move into the early second century the town was reorganised. As I say, all roads lead to Leicester and a new rectangular street grid was formalised, if not entirely laid out. A series of drainage ditches and cambered gravelled roads were set out at regular intervals. And as you saw from the previous slides, our understanding of where these streets were positioned has changed over time. And our latest idea is shown in this plan here. We think this major change in the laying out of the streets probably coincided with Rate's appointment as the Kivitas, or the centre of the uh, Coriol Tarbe. We found some really good survival of Roman streets over the years. Little Lane excavations in the late 1980s, um, followed on from the Jewry Wall excavations in the 1930s. But more recently, excavations at Vine Street had a huge sequence of um, remetalled streets is shown in the top right hand corner here. You can see the compacted layers of gravels replacing the roads as they've been coming worn out over time. And at Stibby, we also found two further streets as well, again with a long sequence of remetalling. In the early second century, when Leicester's street grid was laid out, a large open area in the middle of the town appears to have been surfaced with a thin layer of gravel and set aside. And it was this area that was then used for the construction of the Forum and Basilica. These were huge structures, extremely expensive to build and would have taken many years. We think perhaps 50 years, maybe completing in about the middle of the century. These would have formed the centre of the town for the social, political and religious gatherings, and also it's a marketplace. If you're looking at the plan here, you can see in the middle, the forum was a large open square and surrounded on all three sides, the uh, east, the south and the west sides were colonnades containing shops. The fourth side on the north area was the large basilica. It was a huge building which would have had the officers and the town's administrative um, officers. Now the main way for the pedestrians to come in would have been through the south, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, and we think any carts um, would have come in in the middle area as there's a wider entrance there. The entire complex was about 130 metres long by 19 metres, very, very large indeed. 
The site was excavated in the um, 1960s and into the early 1970s, and the excavations were fairly small scale. So unfortunately, we don't know too much about how these shops would have looked. Hopefully, excavations in the future will be able to tell us more about Leicester's Forum and Basilica. Immediately to the west of the Forum, the citizens of Roman Leicester could enjoy a public baths and gymnasium. Work on this building complex began around AD 125 and probably took around about 30 years to complete. The gymnasium or palestra is now located underneath the church of St Nicholas and we haven't really had a chance to excavate this properly beyond the excavations in the 1930s which found part of it. After exercising in the gymnasium, the visitors could then enter through the arch doorways. And if you look at this photo, the doorway still survives today in the Jewry Wall remains. They then go through the door into the changing rooms to undress and then enter a cold bathhouse, then progressing onto the warm and hot rooms. And these were heated by furnaces. As we said, the site was excavated way back in the 1930s, but over recent years, ULAS have been fortunate enough to do some small scale investigations. And these are a result of the Jewry Wall Museum being refurbished. And as such, some groundworks are needed and some of the archeology span may be disturbed. So we got a chance to reinvestigate some of the areas excavated by Kenyon such as this water tower seen in the bottom right hand corner of the photograph. Um, we took up the floor of the museum and found the water tower. And again, this site is currently being analysed and the forthcoming results should be very interesting. Roman religion was everywhere and it affected all aspects of daily life in the Roman period. But evidence in Leicester is quite scant. We have evidence for one temple, a temple of Mithraeum, which now lies underneath the Holiday Inn in the middle of Leicester on the roundabout. And you can see here excavations from the 1960s. There were some various column fragments found as well, and this nice illustration from the London Mithraeum gives an idea of what it may have looked like. We do have some other objects which shows um, religion forming an important part of the Roman daily life. The object in the middle here, the cursed tablet found at Vine Street, is quite incredible. Um, it mentions a septisonium, which is believed to be a form of monumental facade. It depicts seven gods after whom the Roman days of the week were named. So the sun and the moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus and Saturn. And this is only the fourth known reference to uh, this type of structure in the Roman Empire. These other objects shown on the screen here show other connections to the wider empire. The Oceanus altar was found near the site of the Macellum. Um, there's the ceramic figurine with Venus, silver ring with intaglio, and this wonderful ivory box panel from the um, Roman Egypt. So it shows connections far and wide and a great variety of beliefs. The buildings in the town during this time were generally made of timber. And this image is from our excavations at Vine Street in the early 2000s. And here you can see that the buildings were probably timber framed, resting on low stone walls with quite substantial footings. They all had gravel yards and small fields and stock pens. So this really shows that this boundary between an urban and rural setting is quite um, merged at this point in time. We knew that animals were kept such as pigs, as you can see in the images and cows as well. And the buildings themselves seem to be used for different activities, as shown on the slide. The 
excavations at Blue Boar Lane in the 1950s by John Wacher found an early high status Roman townhouse and it had very good survival for above floor preservation, something we rarely see in Leicester. The house was set back from the streets and at least seven rooms were identified. They were laid out in two wings with a large peristyle courtyard enclosing it to the south. Although its true extent is still unknown, hopefully future work will help clarify its plan. The building is interesting because it was constructed using unfired clay bricks. These were mounted on low stone walls and the walls were initially rendered and then painted with elaborate scenes, as you can see here. Really quite impressive. The floors, though, were clay, concrete or opus signinum and they were later replaced with mosaics as shown here. From the mid second century onwards, some timber buildings were being replaced with more permanent stone founded structures. And this is particularly evident in Insula 5, that's the Vine Street excavations from 2006. Six buildings were constructed and a mixture of workshops and private dwellings were found. Now they were all masonry or clay brick construction rather than timber framed. And the three workshops correspond to a basic form of strip or row building, which is common in Roman Britain. And one of the larger houses had a small bath suite with a hypercourse heated room and a plunge pool. The town during this period was busy, with evidence for craft activities such as pottery, iron, bronze, lead, glass, bone, horn and leather, all evidenced from dumped material. Now these craft activities were spread throughout the town, even close to the Forum. In the now ruined townhouse at Blue Boar Lane, um, by the end of the second century, this townhouse was no longer the home of the wealthy occupant and the area was given over to workshops. A large dump of horn cores in one room shows that either horn working or tanning was occurring in the vicinity. Elsewhere within the building, there was rubbish dumped and graffiti scratched into wall plaster and decorative schemes were being defaced. So what were the people of Roman Leicester eating and drinking? Well, a rich variety of food remains have been found from various excavations, and they show that many enjoyed a varied diet. So we found evidence for bread, stews, peas, beans, apples, plums, cherries, and wild fruit like um, hazelnuts. They'd season their food with herbs such as mint and coriander, and the rich would enjoy things like lentils and dried fruit. Meat would come from cattle, sheep, pig and fowl, and fish and oysters came from much further away. Um, there's also evidence for several wild animals like deer. Interestingly, a possible tavern has been found in Insula 25 during the Shires excavations from the 1980s. So here a large building from the mid second century was rebuilt in the later second century on a similar alignment. Um, up against the street frontage and it contained a timber lined cellar shown here. This was about three meters square and would have been lined and floored with timber planks. And the post holes and the joint impressions um, can still be seen um, in this photograph. Now the feature is very interesting because it produced one of the most important assemblages of Roman pottery from Leicester um, and it seems to represent a single event of infilling using sort of rubbish from the AD 160s to 180s and of particular significance is the presence of a large number of white ware flagons, substantial fragments of Dressel 20 olive oil amphora and several used taze, which is a saucer-like dish. So this perhaps indicates that this is a cellar of a tavern. Um, elsewhere, close to the Forum, from excavations in 2004 on Castle Street, Dumps of Roman pottery were found to the rear of the probable shop, as shown in the um, image at the top right hand corner here. Now, this group of pottery contains amphora, bowls, jars, and flagons, but no drinking vessels, no plates, or no mixing dishes. So, the suggestion is, along with the um, finds from the um, food residues, 
indicates that this was a delicatessen. By the early 3rd century, the city had reached the peak of its development. Along with the finds showing that the town had established trading links with um, areas across Britain and Western Europe, there were also several new major building programmes started. These included a market hall or more Kellen, um, a theatre as well, both of them just to the north of the Forum, and also the construction of a town wall bank and ditches, the town defences. Now, these were built not to keep the inhabitants in a Leicester lockdown, but more likely as a strong display of civic pride and as a way to control access into and out of the town. So Leicester's town defences have been discovered in various small excavations um, over the years. Buckclose Lane and Elbow Lane in the 1960s and Cumberland Street in the 1990s. But it was the major excavation at Sandvigate in 2005 by ULAS that really revealed good preservation of the wall itself and the defensive ditches. And thanks to that excavation, we have a much better understanding of the sequence of its development. And more recently, just in 2019, the Waterside project located further long sections of the town defences. Now, the decision to provide the town defences would have been a massive undertaking, requiring a huge amount of manpower and finance. We do also know that it would have involved the clearance of existing buildings and streets. Again at Waterside in 2019, excavations there found a second century Roman building and also other walls that had been deliberately demolished to make way for the new town defences. And again in the southern part of the town, we see evidence of Roman streets below the ramparts and areas blocked off. Now initially the town defences would have been large ditches with earth ramparts. The rampart itself was around 10 metres wide and around a metre and a half in height, and presumably it would have been topped with a timber palisade. Later, perhaps by the late 3rd century, a substantial stone wall was added to the front of the rampart, and excavations have shown that this is about 3 metres wide and would have risen to about 4 metres in height. Clearly as a sign of Leicester's um, increasing prosperity during this period, a large market hall, or Mackellum, was constructed just to the north of the Forum in the early 3rd century. This was built over the former townhouse of Blue Boar Lane. This massive structure would have been about 16 metres in height, as shown on these plans here. And in 2006, excavations in advance of the High Cross uh, shopping centre found this collapsed wall. As you can see in the top right hand corner, this is an overhead view of the wall as it's collapsed over at some point in the 5th century. You can make out the tile courses that were used in the, the wall and also a relieving arch. And if you look back at Jewry Wall, it's a very similar building technique. The Mackellum would have been full of small shops and market stores um, in between the colonnades, just like Leicester Market today. So what about entertainment during the Roman period? Well, there's long been hints in Leicester of a Roman theatre or amphitheatre, as shown on this slide. Discoveries in the 19th century include this small blue-green glass cup found in 1874 in Bath Lane. That's a typical souvenir found throughout the empire, and that depicts famous gladiators of the time. Um, also in the 19th century, the small Samian pottery with graffiti was found, and it mentions Lucius the Gladiator. Much later in the 1950s, excavations of the Blue Boar Lane townhouse revealed this image of the blue tragic mask, which would have been uh, used at theatres. But more recent excavations by ULAS have discovered further hints of a Roman theatre. In 2006 at Vine Street, this eye and eyebrow from a ceramic theatre mask was discovered. And then in the 
2017 Stibby excavations, we found various gaming pieces like these gaming counters and these dice. But most significantly, we also found this incredible bronze key handle. This unique object was found placed between two floor layers within a large townhouse um, very close to the theatre. It's a unique object and very intricately made. On the top, you can see there is a male figure with trousers and a belt on and hair swept back, exaggerated eyes are sort of bulging out and he has a beard. And here he is being fed to or fighting a lion who is um, grappling him, as you can see. These two figures are standing on four other individuals, four male figures at the bottom. One is seated and the others are in various forms of embrace. Perhaps they are next to fight the lion. So the final public building we know about in Roman Leicester is a Roman theatre. Um, this was located very close to the Macellan, the market hall in the same insula, and it was discovered in the 2017 excavation at Stibby. We found two curving parallel walls, huge constructions, and would have likely held a substantial building. Of course, the interpretation of the theatre may be incorrect. Um, it could have been used for a variety of activities, um, such as an Odeon or Odia as a concert hall for recitals or singing. Um, other functions seen elsewhere in the Empire, um, it could have been for council chambers or political meetings sometimes even cult theatres or public assembly spaces. Hopefully, after further analysis, we may be able to offer a better interpretation of this or else future excavations may help us out. In the later Roman town in Leicester, there are numerous large townhouses and most of them seem to be in the northern part of the town, although this might just reflect where we've done most of the excavations. Uh, the townhouse at Stibby contained a fantastic fine mosaic, one of the finest found in the city so far. And here you can see various images of it under excavation. The image at the top shows the first part of the mosaic that we uncovered. Initially, some of this was seen in the evaluation back in 2001, and we had to wait some 15 years before returning when the area was ready to be redeveloped. We never realised that the mosaic would extend so much beyond this small area that we initially found, but the colours were so strikingly fresh and clean once we clean them with our toothbrushes and brushes. So as the team carefully extended the excavation, um, we revealed more and more of this floor. And it was a fantastic and exciting discovery at the time. And everybody involved in the excavation and at ULAS were um, very excited to find this. It was a remarkable discovery. But as you can see on this slide, you can see how much we are missing. The room itself would have been about 10 metres in length and six metres wide. So the floor would have been huge and very impressive. But we just had these various small pieces surviving. But still, they were the largest fine mosaic found in Leicester in some 100 years since the Victorian period. So a very rare discovery. And we were fortunate to get this much surviving. Most of it was damaged by Victorian factories and earlier medieval activity. Um, the pattern itself would have had some octagons, as you can see, partly surviving on this picture, um, and within it various geometric patterns and with various elaborate borders surrounding it. It certainly would have been a very expensive floor to produce and as was part of a very large townhouse. Clearly a wealthy inhabitant of Roman Leicester 
once resided there. The room had a long use and there was evidence for the floor getting damaged, perhaps by furniture that was in the room. Um, and it wasn't patched up using the tesserae. Instead, it was patched up using Opus Signinum, as you can see from these two photographs. We also had evidence for the walls themselves. You can see in this tray, the walls would have been coloured with all sorts of different colours from the painted wall plaster. And the room itself was heated with a hypercore system. During the course of the Stibby excavations, we were lucky enough to be able to open our doors to the general public. And we had a series of open days during the week and the weekend. In fact, over 5,000 people came to visit us over a few weeks in May 2017. And it was a great experience for all of the team to talk to people and show off what they've been doing. And the mosaic was such an important discovery. As you can see in these pictures here, it was carefully recorded and lifted and has now been preserved and ready to be put on display back in Leicester's Roman Museum at Drury Wall once it's finished its refurbishment. Another contemporary townhouse was this very large building at Norfolk Street, which is actually outside of the Roman town, just half a mile to the west. It was excavated in 1981 with, with um, Richard Buckley as part of the team. And you can see some of the designs in the mosaic are very similar to the ones seen at Stibby. The Vine Street townhouse is our most complete excavated townhouse in Leicester and we were able to understand its evolution over time and by this period in the third and into the fourth century it had all the features you'd expect from a rich Roman uh, individual. Various mosaic floors and tessellated pavements in the corridors, impressive painted walls and heated floor systems and drainage systems as shown in this illustration. So far we've seen lots of the buildings and the objects from Roman Leicester, but what of the people? This slide shows the fabulous Blue Boar Lane townhouse painted walls, and you can just about make out various figures and the clothes that they wore. And these three objects show us names and occupations of three individuals who perhaps lived in Leicester. Another two objects give us another 25 named individuals from Roman Leicester. In the 2006 excavations at Vine Street, two thin sheets of lead were found and each contained inscribed lines of a Latin script. This large one shown here is a curse tablet of Servandus and dates to round about AD 150 to 250. It lists the names of 19 suspects of a theft. His cloak was stolen. And these are thought to be household slaves from the townhouse at Vine Street. The names are 17 men and three women. And the names are a mixture of Latin, British, Germanic and Greek. One name at the bottom is crossed out. So did he prove his innocence or was he the thief? Unfortunately, we'll never know. A second curse tablet lists another four names as well. So we know the names of around about 30 people or so who lived in Roman Leicester. But we have found evidence for the actual bodies of the people across various cemeteries around the town. Most of the cemeteries we know of are in the east, the south, and the west. We haven't found any evidence to the north as yet. We know that the western cemetery was the longest lasting, lasting all the way from the beginning of the Roman period in the first century through to the late fourth century. They had mainly pagan burials. The southern and eastern cemeteries had 
far fewer grave goods and were aligned mainly west-east and appear to be later in date of the third and fourth centuries. Looking at the entire um, assemblage of Roman uh, burials, we can see that many individuals had poor health and malnutrition, certainly in childhood, and there was in, impaired growth, scurvy and rickets. Many of the, of the bodies had signs of illness and disease. The population of Roman Leicester were not all locals born and bred. Even then, Leicester was clearly a multicultural place. Thanks to stable isotope analysis, we've been able to show that there were some people from the region, as you can see in the burial on the top there, some local people from the Leicester area, but there were also people who had a childhood elsewhere, such as the image at the bottom there, which shows an individual who grew up in the Pennine area in the north of England. And interestingly, there are six burials from the Western Cemetery that are suggestive of African or mixed ancestry. And taken together with the Anubis box panel that we showed earlier, it really does point to people travelling far and wide from the empire to live in the city of Leicester. This individual, also found in the Western Cemetery, is worth a special mention. This adult male was aged between 36 and 45 at death and was buried around about AD 345 to 410, so right at the end of the Roman period. Now, he had a few injuries, a healed fracture to his left forearm, an injury to his ri left wrist joint and damage to his muscles in his right upper arm and shoulder. He was buried wearing a chip carved belt plate and a zoomorphic buckle and strap end with crouched dogs. The evidence of these injuries together with the grave goods suggests that this was probably a retired soldier acting perhaps as a civil servant in the town. As we move into the later 4th century, the town underwent some major changes, much like the wider changes affecting Roman Britain and the wider empire as a whole. The town defences appear to have received further additions with external bastions added, and these have been seen in the north side of the town. The forum was remodelled with evidence for industrial activity but at the same time, evidence for a major fire swept through the centre of the town. Roads had begun to silt up with the accumulation of soils, and this was seen close to the Forum and elsewhere. In the adjacent McKellum, a small glass furnace in one room appears to indicate that at least it was partly repurposed for industrial activities. Across the road at Free School Lane, a series of hearths dating to after AD 375, and as shown here at the bottom of the picture, were seen cutting into the edge of the street. So perhaps this indicates a weakened urban control. The public baths show use up to the last quarter of the fourth century, and it's likely that the theatre had long since gone out of use earlier in the century. In a study of the various 4th century private housing in Leicester. Around half of them continue in use into the final quarter of the century, although fines evidence is tricky from this period and the layers themselves often don't survive very well as they're disturbed by later settlement activity. At least two of the largest townhouses were repurposed in the later 4th century at Stibby and Vine Street, and the latter is shown here. At Vine Street, the large townhouse was systematically demolished, leaving only street frontage rooms. And then these were utilised for workshops, one for metalworking and the other as a bone pin workshop. So the town likely had far more open spaces, but it was not one of decline and ruin. Rather, it was more of a dramatic reuse of the urban space. Perhaps the urban dwelling aristocracy had withdrawn from the town. 
and so much of the public and monumental architecture was poorly maintained. Some urban functions likely did remain intact, such as administration and tax collection, and perhaps some trade. But how long this con continued into the fifth century continues to be a subject of intense debate in the archeology span world. As we move into the fifth century, following the withdrawal of Roman political and military control, the end of Roman Britain in AD 410, our understanding of the town and life within it dramatically dims and Leicester seemingly becomes a town in the dark, i.e. its functions as a Roman town, a centre for trade, exchange and entertainment end. But life within the town during the fifth century and beyond continues, albeit in a much transformed way. This early Anglo-Saxon period is an intriguing and interesting period of time to unravel, and our recent excavations within the city and within the county more widely have begun to shed more light on this dark period. The former Roman town was still lived in. Uh, we found evidence for timber housing, burials and finds, but that story is for another time. So all of this amazing knowledge and understanding of Leicester's Roman past couldn't have been possible without the hundreds of archaeologists who've dug and recorded through the layers beneath our feet in Leicester. And also thanks to all the finds and environmental specialists who've identified and interpreted the sherds of pop and seeds. And of course, thanks to the various developers who funded the projects. ULAS has discovered much over the past 25 years, building on a much longer period of discoveries, but I'm sure there is still much to learn beyond 2020. Look out for more talks from my ULAS colleagues on the uh, usual ULAS social media channels. And thank you for watching, if indeed you still are. Good night.